thanks for your interest in space exploration because I think this is the most important thing going on in the world today as viewed by the people of the future. Okay, uh, you know, if I asked any of you what happened in 1492, then I imagine you'd be able to say, well, Columbus sailed in 1492, and that is correct. But any number of other things happened in 1492 that might have seemed much more important to people at that time. Okay, the England and France signed a peace treaty in 1492. The Borgias took over the papacy in 1492. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, the richest man in the world, died in 1492. Okay, those would have been the headlines had there been newspapers in 1492. But we don't remember that. We remember what was done to make our world possible. And that is what people in the future are going to remember about this time. This time is going to be remembered because this is when we first set sail to other worlds. So I'm going to talk here, uh, I'm going to narrow the focus to how to get humans to Mars. Uh, tonight I'm going to give a much broader scope of the, the whole case for space and how the revolution in space flight is opening up an unlimited future. That's for tonight. But right now this is going to be a how-to talk, which I'm going to give very briefly in order to maximize the time for questions and discussion. You've seen pictures like this. I don't think we need this to go to Mars. This is futuristic stuff that has nothing to do with Mars. It's about realizing the vision of the science fiction spaceship. Going to Mars is not about realizing the vision of the science fiction spaceship. It's about sending packages. Sending a package to Mars capable of supporting a small group of people and then sending either that or a comparable package back. So what do we need? Okay. We do need heavy lift. This is Florida, uh, 1970, actually. Uh, but, you know, we had heavy lift in the past. We can have it again. Uh, NASA, of course, is developing a space launch system, SLS. SpaceX is developing a Starship. Uh, and uh, either way, in the relatively near future, we will have heavy lift again. And if you have heavy lift, um, this is how you could do a Mars mission. Uh, in the first year of flight operations, um, we use one booster to send an automated payload to Mars. Weighs about 40 tons. Flies to Mars on a minimum energy trajectory. Takes eight months. Arrow breaks, lands. Okay. Uh, the payload consists of a number of things. The main object is the Earth return vehicle. It's a little rocket ship for flying back from Mars. It's got two propulsion stages that uses methane oxygen propellant, but they're not filled with propellant now. However, the lower stage tanks are, contain about six tons of liquid hydrogen, probably in gelled form, and slung below the vehicle, not shown in this diagram. We have a light truck, like a little pickup truck. It's got a little nuclear reactor in it. Uh, 100 kilowatts. 100 kilowatts is like 130 horsepower. It's the same amount of power that powers a medium-sized car. So we're not talking about a giant nuclear power plant that powers the city. We're just talking about a nice little putt-putt nuke in the back of the truck. Okay. Anyway, it is landed. Okay, they telerobotically drive the truck a few hundred yards away from the landing site, unwinding a cable off the back of it as it goes. Then they put the reactor on the ground, and then they run a pump. And you suck in the Martian air which is mostly carbon dioxide. You react that with some of the hydrogen you brought from Earth. It produces methane CH4, water H2O. Methane's great fuel. That's your fuel to come home. The water you electrolyze. You split into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen's the oxidizer to burn the methane. The hydrogen's recycled to do it again, and uh, so on. And then to get additional oxygen, we have a third reactor in which we take carbon dioxide and we split it into carbon monoxide and oxygen. The oxygen we keep, the carbon monoxide, we dispose of as waste. You can do that on Mars. There's no EPA there. So when <laughs> it's all done, you've turned six tons of hydrogen from Earth into 108 tons of methane oxygen by propellant on the surface of Mars. It's a leverage of 18 to 1. It's like being able to buy gasoline for 15 cents a gallon. Um, the, uh, it's a good deal, especially since it costs a lot to haul the stuff there. A lot, lot, lot. Uh, okay. So now you've got a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting waiting for you on the surface of Mars. Okay. I've built things that do this. Uh, next, um, 
opportunity. You can fly to Mars every other year. It's actually every 26 months, roughly every two years. You launch two more rockets. Another shoots out another Earth return vehicle. The other shoots out a habitat craft with a crew of four astronauts in it. Um, because our return ride is waiting for us on Mars, we don't need to fly to Mars in a gigantic Imperial Star Destroyer, as you saw in the previous illustration. We can fly to Mars in a tuna can, okay? Which is a good thing, because they're a lot simpler than Star Destroyers. And uh, though it is bigger than the Chicken of the Sea unit, this is about eight meters in diameter and uh, six meters tall. So you got two decks, each with three meters of uh, ceiling. Um, the lower deck is sort of a cargo hold workshop kind of place. The upper deck is where the crew lives. Here is one possible layout of the upper deck. You see a little stateroom for each of the four astronauts. You see a toilet area, a wardroom for eating and hanging out, uh, exercise and science area, and so on. And in the center is what's called the solar flare storm shelter. Uh, there's two kinds of radiation that can get you interplanetary space. There's cosmic rays and solar flares. They're entirely different. Okay, solar flares come from the sun. They come unpredictably. You could get a big one about once a year. Uh, and in the course of a few hours, it could deliver a thousand rems or more of radiation to an unshielded astronaut, which is enough to kill. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that the kind of radiation that it is is just protons with energies on the order of a million volts. That kind of stuff you can shield against with uh, five inches of water or things that from the nuclear point of view are the same thing as water like food or things that water and food become as the mission unfolds. And um, we have enough on board the ship to pack it in around a limited central area. Solar flare happens, the alarm rings, everybody goes in there, they stay in there a few hours until it's over and they come out. That's how you're safe against solar flares. The other kind of radiation though is different, is cosmic rays. Cosmic rays don't come from the sun. They come into our solar system from interstellar space. We don't really know what causes them. It's a mystery. But they do certainly exist. They're particles coming zipping into our solar system from interstellar space with energies not of millions of volts, but billions of volts. That is a thousand times more energy for each particle than a solar flare particle. So you can't stop it with five inches of water. It take meters of water to stop it. And in fact, here on Earth, you are protected by an atmosphere which is the equivalent of 10 meters of water sitting on top of you right now. Okay, and that's why you're shielded against cosmic rays. But we couldn't have that much shielding on a spacecraft. So you're going to take that dose. That's the bad news. The good news is the magnitude of the dose is not that big. It's around um, um, 50 rem for every year you're in space. Uh, 50, and you're going to be in space a year on this mission. It's going to be six months out, six months back, a year and a half on the surface. On the surface, you can shield yourself. On the space, you can't. So you're going to take a year in space worth of cosmic rays, 50 rem over actually a two and a half year period, um, would not represent any immediate threat. It is a statistical risk. It's like smoking. There's no direct causal relationship between smoking a cigarette today and dying. Okay, it's smoking as a habit statistically increases your risk of cancer. Okay, and 50 REMS would increase your risk of cancer by about 1% um, in comparison to smoking, which would increase it by about 20. So uh, this is a risk, but it is a modest risk uh, against risks that many people take normally for whatever reason, and in fact, you could reduce their risk of cancer by sending them to Mars if they were smoking, because you send them without their tobacco. <laughs> and the, uh, that's the way to get them to kick the habit, as long as you make sure they can't get the stuff into the spacecraft. Anyway, and uh, what this graph shows, by the way, is that there's been a whole bunch of astronauts and cosmonauts that have already, on the space station, got cosmic ray doses comparable to what they would have gotten to going to Mars and back, and there have been no radiological casualties. Uh, nor would you expect them to be among a group of 10 people, each of whom got a 1% risk. You'd probably, no one would get hit. Um, however, there is another risk of health to space, which we definitely have seen effects, and that is zero gravity deconditioning. 
Zero gravity weakens bone and muscle. Absolutely does. And we can see it. Uh, and while you can survive six months in zero gravity, every astronaut that goes to the space station does exactly that. Um, they come back weakened. And you don't want them weakened because their program on Mars is field exploration. And hiking around in a spacesuit is a physical activity. And it would be extremely detrimental to accomplish the goals of a mission to have them arrive on Mars and not be able to do that. So I um, recommend artificial gravity, which we can make by tethering off. This is the upper stage of the booster that threw the payload to Mars. So it's flying to Mars along with us. We can go turn around, pull the string out. This tether's about a mile long. And you spin this up at one RPM, and you can create Mars gravity in the hab through centrifugal force. Uh, if you spin it a little less than two RPM, you'd get Earth gravity in the hand. And that is how I would keep the crew in shape. So we fly out to Mars. Um, we're on a six-month trajectory to Mars because you can go. The minimum energy trajectory is eight months. That's the, the minimum push gets you there in eight. Little extra oomph gets you there in six. If you try to get there much faster than that, it takes a lot of extra propellant, which is going to limit your payload, uh, which you don't want to do because limiting payload is limiting safety. A payload includes the redundancy of your life support system and all these other things. So there's a trade to be made here between going fast and going with everything you need. Okay. Uh, also, six month has the advantage that if you decide to abort the mission, you could fly past Mars and loop around to about two astronomical units distance from the sun. And you'd loop back, and you'd reach one astronomical unit from the sun, that is to say the Earth's distance from the sun, exactly two years after you left. So guess what would be there? Earth, Earth yeah. That's a good thing if you want to come home. Because if you tried to go to Mars faster, you would loop out further. It would take you more than two years to get back, and you miss the bus. Um, so the, the six-month orbit to Mars is actually the best orbit, not 5.9, not 6.1, 6. Okay? If you had a superior propulsion system like nuclear thermal propulsion that in principle could get you to Mars faster, I wouldn't use it for that purpose. I would just use it to increase the payload and still take the six-month transit. Anyway, they're on a six-month transit to Mars. When they get close to Mars, you fire a pyrotechnic that cuts the cable. This goes bye-bye. You aerobrake, you land on Mars near the Earth return vehicle. Okay. If you landing is way off course, you have a second Earth return vehicle that you could bring down to land near you. Uh, you don't have to be that close, though, because you have a ground rover in here with a one ring range of 600 miles. But you know, in the Apollo, we actually landed within 200 yards of a surveyor craft that had been put on the moon before. Uh, so we should be able to hit it. But even if we're on the wrong side of the planet, we can still save the mission with a second Earth return vehicle. So we land there, okay, and assuming we don't land on the wrong side of the planet, we could land this anywhere we want. You could land it in the same general area. You could land it on the other side of the planet. I prefer to land a few hundred miles away because it is going to define where the next landing is. Um, and, but I'd like it to be within at least long range driving distance from this one so that if something does go wrong with this Earth return vehicle, we could drive over here and take this one back. But the main purpose of this one is not to support them. It is to enable the next human mission, which will fly there two years later, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, which otherwise opens up exploration site number three. Okay. So the idea is two boosters every two years. That's an average of one per year. When we were flying the space shuttle in a serious way, we were averaging six a year. So you're talking about using one sixth of your heavy lift capability to support this, which means it doesn't have to monopolize the whole program. You could do the moon at the same time. You can do asteroids. You can do other stuff. Okay. Um, so it, it's an affordable way to go. So this is an actual photograph of the Mars base transmitted from the future to you. <laughs> uh, OK. So we use tachyons. That's how we got this. Um, anyway, here's the hab on Mars. There's the Earth return vehicle. Here's the reactor in the background. Here's some solar panels they set up as backup power if they have to turn the reactor off. Here's an exploration a vehicle, pressurized rover, like a little 4x4. That's another source of backup power. You could always run the engine on that. 
Uh, there's also another vehicle, the light truck, that was used to deploy the reactor as a backup car for this one. This is an inflatable greenhouse. It is uh, not a mission critical element. It's an experiment in growing crops on Mars using Martian water, Martian soil, Martian gravity, Martian sunlight for the benefit of research for uh, feeding future uh, settlements and missions and so on. Okay. You're on Mars a year and a half. Why? Because that's what you have to be for the planets to move around to give you your launch window back to Earth. You actually have two alternatives. There, there, there's two different trajectory combinations that get you to Mars. One is known as the conjunction class, which is what this is, which is like six months out, year and a half on Mars, six months back. The other is opposition class, which is a total of about two years, or even 1.9 years total, in two very unequal legs of transit, but only one month at Mars. So in the opposition mission is less time away from Earth, but only 5% of the mission time is spent on Mars. The conjunction mission, instead of being two years, is two and a half, but 60% of the mission time is on Mars. And that's the productive part of the mission. So that's why I, I, I choose that plan, okay? Because if you want minimum time away from Earth, don't leave. <laughs> okay, uh, you know. If you want to go to Mars, go to Mars. Anyway, we're on Mars a year and a half. We're exploring. There's all sorts of scientific questions to be answered about Mars. It's geology. It's meteorology. It's this, that. There's all sorts of stuff that professors will get to write papers about but and get tenure, and they'll be able to put kids through college, and that's very important. But there's two questions about Mars that make it of interest, not just to academics seeking publications, but to humanity at large. First set of questions is, was there, is there life on Mars? This is a real photo of Mars sent to us from the past. Um, you can get messages from the past. You, okay, you cannot get them from the future. That's how this works. Anyway, uh, this was taken by Viking in 1976. And uh, what you can see here are dry riverbeds on Mars. They're all over the place. And in fact, since then, we've discovered vast networks of water erosion features all over Mars. Um, and um, as well as salt deposits left on the shorelines of ancient lakes, the basin of a, what used to be an ocean on the, in the northern hemisphere of Mars. There's no question that Mars once had liquid water. And in fact, it had liquid water on its surface for a period five times as long as there was liquid water on Earth. Um, before there was life here. That is, life appears on Earth within a couple of hundred million years of there being liquid water on Earth. Liquid water on Mars for a billion years. So if the theory is correct that life develops from chemistry wherever it has reasonable conditions, i.e. liquid water, various minerals, some sunlight, all this kind of stuff, it should have been, life should have appeared on Mars. And if we can go to Mars and find fossils of past life on the surface, will have verified that life evolves from chemistry wherever it has a decent chance. If we can go to Mars and drill down into the ground where there is liquid water underground now, there is. OK, we know that. We have found it with ground penetrating radar. That is a habitable environment for microbes. If the surface became uninhabitable, they could have retreated into the groundwater, much as the earliest life on Earth has done. That is, the earliest life on Earth can no longer live on the surface of the Earth because the early Earth that they evolved in had no oxygen in its atmosphere. Oxygen is an artifact of green plants, and it's toxic to these early microorganisms. They retreated into the groundwater. They've been there for three billion years on Earth. They've seen the trilobites come and go, the dinosaurs come and go, the mastodons come and go, the Wehrmacht come and go. They don't care. Okay, They're going to be there after we're gone. Anyway, the point is, they could still be there on Mars. And if we drill down into that water, bring up some of that water, we could see what they're like. We could see if they are like Earth life or not. And, and this is really important because, you see, all Earth life at the biochemical level is the same. That is, it all uses the same method of transmitting information from one generation to the next, RNA, DNA. Okay. That's our alphabet. Now, you know, we, English speakers, we use the Latin alphabet. So do the Spanish countries. So do the French. The 
very minor differences. Germans, even. Russians, they use an alphabet that's significantly different, but has many similarities and works on the same principles, because it has a common origin in the Greek alphabet, which both the Latin alphabet and the Russian alphabet came from. But the Chinese alphabet is totally different, completely different. It does not have a common origin. It works on a completely different set of principles than the Latin alphabet or the Cyrillic alphabet. Okay, it's different. Okay, so the question is, does life everywhere in the universe use the Latin alphabet, or are some of them using the Chinese alphabet, or the Hindu alphabet, or the various other alphabets that it can be? All these different alphabets we have among nations on Earth serve the same purpose. They put language down on paper, but they could, just as genetic alphabets will all need to serve the same purpose of transmitting information from one generation to the next. But does everybody use the Latin alphabet, or can there be a much greater diversity of different forms of life? This is fundamental, and we could find this out by drilling into the water of Mars. And uh, it, this has both theoretical implications in terms of the potential prevalence and diversity of life in the universe. It also has practical implications because, uh, you know, life is nanotechnology. It is self-reproducing machines. And, you know, if you have different ways that you can transmit information with computers, like now they're working on quantum computers, okay, which they don't have yet, but it has all sorts of potential. We went beyond the kind of computers we have. The kind of computers we have now certainly go beyond the Babbage machines, which were the first computers of the mechanical gear things that you turn around. And, uh, okay, so if you can program life in, in, in different forms of way, it, it potentially represents terrific powers uh, uh, Industrial, medical, agricultural, you name it. Um, or even for terraforming planets. Okay. So, oh, anyway, hold on. So, we're there on a year and a half. The end of a year and a half. We get in the Earth return vehicle. We start it up. We take off. Fly back to Earth. We leave all the rest of this stuff behind on Mars. Is this bad, leaving all this very expensive aerospace equipment behind on Mars? Uh, no, we don't need to bring that stuff back. We have a lot of stuff here already. The idea of Mars missions is to bring as much stuff to Mars as you can and come back with as little as you can because everything you leave behind on Mars is available for future missions. So this is what it might look like. This is a map of Mars. Texas is there for scale. Um, Mars is much bigger. Um, each of these missions, if they were at the center of these circles, the ground car could go as far as the circle, uh, or you could drive from one center to the other. You could be, ex as the missions proceed, you could have an area of continental size you can explore. But at, 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 after a certain amount of time has passed, the issue is not going to be exploring for past or present life on Mars. The issue is going to be, will there be life on Mars? Because what is Mars? It's not just an object of scientific inquiry. It is a world with a surface area equal to all the continents of the Earth put together that has on it all the resources needed to support life and therefore human civilization. And if we can go to Mars and learn how to take those materials and turn them into resources, okay, there aren't resources there now. There are materials there now. There's no such thing as natural resources. There's only natural raw materials. It is resourceful people who turn materials into resources. It's an important point. Anyway, if you can do that, you can make Mars habitable. Now, what do I mean by make Mars habitable? Do I mean terraform the planet, you know, like in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, where they shoot the Genesis machine? The world becomes filled with plants and lakes and butterflies and chipmunks and flying fish. Well, sure, that's what we got to do. Uh, and um, and I, will, I actually believe we will do that with Mars someday because we're life and it is the um, fundamental uh, nature of life to take barren environments and transform them into those that are favorable for the development and propagation of life. 
That's why life on Earth has been a success. It has made the Earth more fertile in its own interests. Okay. If life did not make the Earth better for life, life would have gone extinct. Okay. So life has terraformed the Earth. Life is going to terraform Mars. We are the vanguard of life. We're going to do it. But probably not you. Certainly not me. That is a little beyond our time. Uh, but what we can do is have the honor of making Mars habitable in a different sense. Not so much physically as intellectually. Because, look, the thing that determines whether an environment is habitable or not is only partially an objective function of the environment itself. It's also largely a function of you. Can you take the materials there and turn them into resources that support you? Okay? Two people can be stranded in a forest. One could live there indefinitely. The other could starve to death in three weeks. And the difference is to one, the potential resources of the forest are apparent, and to the other, they are invisible. Okay? Same with Mars. So, we establish a base on Mars. We use that to develop the technologies to turn Martian materials into resources. The Mars Direct program starts with the most elementary thing using the atmosphere. We can go beyond that. Immediately we want to access Martian ice. Then we don't need to bring hydrogen to Mars. We can electrolyze the water. We've got oxygen, hydrogen. We can make propellant. We can grow plants, make food, fibers, plastics. Um, we can also make uh, glass, uh, iron. Mars is red because it's iron oxide so forth, wires, tubes, habitation structures, move up this level of craft, and as you do, it becomes possible to support more and more people on Mars until ultimately new branches of human civilization can develop on Mars that will grow in size and potency and in industrial and technological capability until they have the possibility of physically transforming Mars itself. So that's the program. We don't just bring life to Mars, we bring Mars to life. And there it is. So let's talk. A priori reasons why, although it's not definite, but there's certainly arguments that can be made why life needs to be carbon based. Because the carbon atom has the capability of producing all sorts of very complex molecules and variants and, and, and so on. And, and why it should also be uh, water, active space, sort of carbon water life. That's what we are. Okay, you can make that argument. But DNA, that's a very specific method of transmitting information. Okay, so um, there doesn't seem to be any a priori argument that can be made why it has to be DNA, why you couldn't come up with a different system for transmitting information. Uh, just like, you know, while you know, putting imprints on solid materials is clearly uh, the way one has to write books. It doesn't have to be the Latin alphabet. One could have invented an entirely different alphabet or things like Chinese, which are actually ultimately based in pictograms instead of phonetic sound things. Um, and uh, so our, our method of transmitting information in alphabets is based on sound. Theirs is based on images, okay? And one could have come up with something even uh, different than those. Um, so, yeah, it could be something entirely different. If there was, like, sentient beings civilization on Mars, then it would be improper to colonize it, sure. Okay, that would be imperialism. But if there's nothing on Mars but microbes, then it's entirely proper to colonize it. Uh, I mean, and, and I mean, look, some people have said, no, it wouldn't. That's imperialism. Well, that's nonsense. Okay. Imperialism as it occurred on Earth was wrong because it harmed people, not because it harmed microbes. Okay. You know, Albert Schweitzer went to Africa and killed billions of bacteria with antibiotics. No one calls him a war criminal. Okay. The, the, the you know, uh, ethics has to be human based. Um, 
Okay, when I was a kid, um, Christopher Columbus was viewed as, as a, a very positive and heroic figure. Okay, and sometime if you're, new, you, new, if you're in New York City, you should go to Columbus Circle where there's a statue of Columbus that was put up in 1892, the 400th anniversary of Columbus's landing, and it says, to the world he gave away. Okay, now he's much more controversial. There are people who picket Columbus Day parades. They say, look, as a result of Columbus, the Native American cultures were destroyed. Now, obviously, he didn't do it himself, but that is the sequel. Okay, And sure, Europeans colonized North America. And as a result, uh, a lot was created and a lot was destroyed. Okay, There were Native American cultures. There were 60 million bison. There were towering redwood forests. We replaced that with a continental culture, a continental country based on liberty with cities and universities and used bookstores and all this stuff. Okay? And you can say, well, something was created, something was destroyed. And reasonable people can argue about whether what was created is more or less than what was destroyed. But I, I submit to you that if there had been nothing here when Columbus landed but a, a desert with maybe a few microbes in the groundwater, and we, from that, we created all this, that no one would be picketing Columbus Day parades today. So, sure. And to, it, given what Mars is, to go there and establish new branches of human civilization there, complete with cities, universities, and used bookstores, uh, and, and as well as new homes for various species of life on Earth to go forth and multiply and diversify, uh, I think we should do that. I think that is something grand and wonderful to do. And if you have it in your power to do something grand and wonderful, then you should. Yeah. I have something the discovery of um, the discovery of microbes on Mars could also be something bad for us. Not just that it could they could carry some sort of uh, bacteria, some sort of disease that we just like don't know. Okay, that's uh, a concern that 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 some people ha have brought up, but. Here's the thing about that. Okay. Um, there is natural transport of material between Mars and Earth. And uh, some of you may have heard um, that in 1996, a rock was discovered on Earth that had been ejected from Mars by meteoric impact and landed in Antarctica and then subjected to scientific study. This is Allen Hill's 84001. Uh, it was actually discovered in 1984, but the government put it in the warehouse where they keep the lost Ark of the Covenant, and it wasn't rediscovered until 1996. Okay, so that's what happened. But anyway, so um, the, 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 and then there was a group of scientists who said that they found evidence of past life on Mars in that rock. Now those claims were and remain controversial. They are not universally agreed to at all. But that's not my point. What did happen as a result of those claims was that rock was subjected to greater in-depth study than any other rock in the history of the world. And what it was found was that Large portions of that rock in its entire career of being ejected from Mars, flight through space, re-entry, and landing on Earth, large portions of that rock were not raised above 40 centigrade, which means that had there been microbes in that rock, they would have survived the trip. It rock was so in other words, material is being transported that is not sterilized. And in fact, we get around 500 kilograms of such rocks landing on Earth every year. To date, the only casualty has been a dog who was in Egypt in 1911 was hit by one. Okay. It, what I'm saying is that um, if we could get the Red Death from Mars, we already have. Uh, that is, microbes have, or if, if microbes could travel from Mars, are on Mars, they've already been delivered to Earth. Now, it could be, by the way, that this is the origin of life on Earth. Because Mars had liquid water before Earth did. 
Mars cooled before Earth did. Uh, so there is, uh, and, and there is a mystery to life on Earth in that we see no free living organisms simpler than bacteria, which suggests that life on Earth could be an immigrant phenomenon. That is, it could have been brought here uh, uh, already developed to the level of bacteria from somewhere else, possibly Mars. Or they both could have been seeded from a third source. Now, there are some people who are putting very tight constraints on NASA's plans Mars sample return mission over this very issue uh, of quarantining the samples and this and that and not sending samples directly back from the Martian surface, but they have to transfer from this spacecraft to that spacecraft to the next spacecraft, and it makes the mission much more complicated and difficult to do. Uh, I think that this is um, not rational uh, because the rocks are coming here on their own all the time. Yeah? Um, but uh, I also think of another example as like smallpox. Uh, yes. They had smallpox in Europe for thousands of years, and the amount of stuff that just floats through the ocean, like from Europe to America, to that if we are considering those like rocks, uh, uh, and they are floating over, if you would be able, with your idea, to be able to um, uh, get the idea that maybe smallpox would have floated over, and maybe would have found some life. Maybe we've just gotten extremely unlucky with like what came to Earth, and there was some sort of, there is some sort of bacteria or something on Mars. Well, the, the additional problem is this, is that, um, first of all, this has been going on for billions of years, not thousands of years. Second of all, the surface of Mars is irradiated with ultraviolet light. Uh, in other words, it, it, it has conditions in it that are, we use to sterilize hospital environments and other places uh, like this all the time is the prevailing condition on the surface of Mars. There's no macro fauna or macro flora on Mars for pathogens to live off of, unlike Eurasia, which was filled with people uh, who, of course, had diseases and therefore could represent a potential source of disease for the New World people, whereas there's no people on Mars. There's, in other words, there's, or dogs or horses or even you know, newts or anything, you know, and generally we only get diseases from things that are closely related to us. We get diseases from other people, there's some diseases we can get from birds or higher mammals, but I, I don't know anybody who's ever gotten Dutch elm disease. Um, and uh, so the, the and, and, or trees don't get colds. And, 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 and so there's, or disease organisms are, are pretty specific to hosts, uh, at least in a general sense. And so the, the idea that there could be pathogens on Mars is, is fantastical because there's no macrofauna. And then I would bring up the following point, is that the Earth all the time is being exposed to pathogens from a planet which we know was full of pathogens, which is the Earth of the past. Every time somebody digs a hole, they're exposing sediments from 100 years ago, 500 years ago, in some cases a million years ago, uh, in periods when we know that there were diseases. And we, we don't um, you know, impose quarantine restrictions on gardeners or archaeologists or paleontologists or any of these people who are constantly bringing back material from the earth of the past. Uh, and so I, I just don't think it's um, a major concern. Has there been any discussion in, in, in your circle, Val, about um, can we make a discovery on Mars that would show that there's other atoms besides carbon that are the basics of life? Well, in principle, you could. I mean, if you discovered uh, a non-carbon-based life form. But how do you know that? Has there been discussions about how that would manifest itself? Well, it, it could be difficult to, in other words, if it was a static life form that doesn't move or anything, that might be difficult to distinguish from a mineral. On the other hand, if it's, you know, an animal that Maybe runs around, it, you, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, 
that plays the piano, yeah. that shoots lasers, uh, that throws hand grenades. Okay. Other, uh, sir. I, I wonder uh, what would be the value of going to Mars? Like, for example, going to the moon, they talked about finding helium-3 to power the country and that type of thing. But all the landings on the moon, I don't think anything, the Earth hasn't gained anything from other than scientific, basic scientific knowledge. So what is the well, uh, reasons uh, to go to Mars? And, and the other, the second question is, um, is, is anybody actually, the United States or any country or private companies looking into the ways to get there? You know, your method, Mars Direct, or taking, you know, these larger shuttles. I mean, is anybody actually working on it with plans to do this? Okay. Those are two very good questions. Uh, I would give um, three fundamental reasons to go to Mars for the science, for the challenge, and for the future. Okay. Science I've already alluded to, resolving this question of the potential preva prevalence and diversity of life in the universe, which is not merely um, a philosophical question, although it is that. It's something that thinking men and women have wondered about for thousands of years. It also could have very practical implications in biology, agronomy, medicine, and so forth. Second for the challenge. And let me tell you what we got out of Apollo. We got millions of young scientists and engineers. We doubled the number of science graduates in this country in the 1960s during Apollo. And then the rate of increase completely flattened off in the 70s as soon as the program ended. And, um, and I think people in this room might have an intuitive understanding of why that happened. It's very simple. What does youth love? Adventure. A bold space program makes science the great adventure. Okay? And so we doubled our science graduates. And those people, now I, I'm one of those people, okay? Uh, I happen to be unusual among that group in that I actually ended up doing space. A lot of the rest of them went off and built Silicon Valley, and that's why they have a lot more money than me. Um, but intellectual capital is the basis of economic progress, medical progress, every kind of progress. All the problems of the world that everybody talks about, how can we go to Mars when we have this problem and that problem? Well, the way you're going to solve those problems is with intellectual capital. Okay? And the, uh, we got a lot of it. And NASA, in my opinion, has not adequately explained this because they talk about concrete spin-off technologies, they call it, that have come out of the space program. Some of them are quite significant. Solar energy, okay, which many people now see as vital to the human future. Well, that came out of the space program, okay. So it's not just Teflon and you know frying pans, okay. It's some pretty important stuff, but but still, it's not the specific inventions that were made by the space program that are the main thing. The main thing is all the numerous inventions made by people who became scientists or engineers or inventors or technological entrepreneurs or medical researchers because they were inspired by the great adventure of, sp uh, 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 of space. Okay. And I think that in this day and age, a bold space program would have a much bigger social impact uh, than it did in, in the 60s. Okay, I'm looking around this room and rough count is at least as many women in this room as there are men. Uh, that would not have been the case in the 1960s, I'll tell you that. Uh, there wouldn't have been one. Uh, and uh, the, in other words, the science and engineering as fields are far more open to women and minorities today than they were in the 1960s. And so 
we would not only get millions of little boy math scientists making rocket fuel and robots in the basement to their parents' great distress, but a lot of little girl math scientists too, which is scary. But anyway, um, so yes, that will be the concrete payoff. And then finally, there's the future, which is the creation of new branches of human civilization, of unlimited potential. You know, Columbus sold the mission, said, I'm going to find you a spice route to India. Well, he didn't find it. But sure, the Spanish did find some native cultures they could loot of their gold reserves. But that was not the major profit that Europe got out of America. The major profit that Europe got out of America was the creation of new branches of Western civilization, one of which invented democracy and steamboats and telegraphs and light bulbs and centrally generated electrical power and motion pictures and aeroplanes and nuclear power and computers and the internet. Okay, So there, there's nothing more valuable than, than creating new centers of human creativity. That, that is what we're going to get from Mars. Do you have a question, Laura? Uh, yes, I was going to add uh, uh, my thought that uh, I thought I feel like it's worth um, considering that gaining knowledge for the sake of gaining knowledge is just as worth space exploration as you know mining from other planets or getting things that would be profitable on earth like um, in the long run like you know, um, I feel like increasing our knowledge of the universe and how it works is going to benefit us as a species far more than, you know, the short term goals of getting more helium for or getting more uh, whatever is profitable uh, right now. I just think I just think that we shouldn't discount um, the human drive to understand saying basic science, just the basic yes. gathering of knowledge. Yes, the gathering of knowledge in like multiple different fields. I feel like if like going to Mars would be an exponential, uh, would be like this huge step in scientific understanding because of up until this point, we have not stepped foot on another planet. We've stepped off a foot on our moon, but that's a very different um Circumstance, and even when we did step on the moon, we got a whole lot of insight into our universe. It wasn't just like, oh, we went to the moon and we didn't find anything. We found so much information that, like, like uh, Zubrin was saying, like, um, just like helped us improve as a society. And so I think it's worth just like going out and exploring just to see what's out there. I don't think that's necessarily a an unworthy cause. You mean like that guy right there was saying in his book? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm well, just or, or to, here, the physicist uh, Leon Lederman was once giving a testimony in Congress in support of some major new uh, physics accelerator that he wanted to get funded. And one of the congressmen asked him, uh, well, will this accelerator help our national defense? And he said, uh, no, but it'll make the country more worth defending. Yes. Um, so I have much more of like a future question. Uh, how would you go about making an atmosphere on Mars so that it's habitable, so that you can breathe without a helmet on? And how long do you think that that would take to happen? Well, okay. The way I would do it, and it's explained in the book, um, but is First thing is to warm the planet. Okay. Now we know how to do that, right? Okay. Um, we're pretty good at that. Um, the uh, okay, and in fact, we could do a better job if we really wanted to. That is, greenhouse gases are the way to warm the planet. Now we know about okay. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and in fact, Mars would be significantly colder if it didn't have a thin CO2 atmosphere that's helping to greenhouse it a bit. But 
we know about artificial greenhouse gases. For example, one molecule uh, called uh, CF4, carbon tetrafluoride, okay? One carbon, four fluorines, uh, is a super powerful greenhouse gas. And if we produced it on purpose on Mars and released it into the atmosphere, we currently make it on Earth for perp it's a refrigerant. It can be it's used in refrigerators and air conditioners and things. But if we produced it on Mars, not for that purpose, but for the purpose of greenhousing the planet, uh, and we produced it at the same rate we currently produce that and similar molecules, fluorocarbons and chlorofluorocarbons and this sort of stuff, uh, on Earth, in 50 years you'd raise Mars 10 centigrade. Now that's a lot. Okay, the total global warming on Earth since 1880 is about one centigrade. Okay, this is 10 times that and in 50 years. Okay, and the, uh, that would have some pretty impressive effects. It would cause vast amounts of carbon dioxide that is currently soaked into the soil to outgas, greatly thickening the atmosphere of Mars, probably 30 times over. That would then add a lot to the greenhouse effect too and also give you enough pressure that water could be in the liquid phase, not just gas or solid. Uh, so then what would happen is some of the water that's frozen into the soil and, or as ice would start to melt and those dry riverbeds on Mars would flow again or dry lakes would fill up again. You'd have liquid water on Mars, you'd have rain. Um, and then you could start spreading plants on the surface. Now, If we did that, okay, we could warm Mars and, and, and also then you'd have enough pressure, you wouldn't need to wear a spacesuit, you would just need a breathing mask. Um, we could do that in less than a century. To, if you then spread plants all over the planet, they start making oxygen. But if we talk about using the kind of plants that we have now, they're only about 1% efficient in terms of turning sunlight into chemical energy, i.e. carbohydrates and oxygen. Okay, so it would take them about a thousand years to oxygenate the planet enough for you to breathe. However, if we're talking about something that people are going to be doing in seriousness maybe a century from now, it's really not that great a leap to think of genetically engineering more efficient plants. And if they were 5% efficient instead of 1% efficient, you could oxygenate the place much faster. Or alternatively, Here's another way to think about it. See, because while I just explained to you how I would terraform Mars, I'm not going to be the one who terraforms Mars. The people who terraform Mars are going to know a lot more science than I do, okay? Uh, because their time will know more science than we do. And, you know, um, in 1865, Jules Verne wrote a novel about sending people to the moon. And he got a lot right. He launched the crew from Florida. They launched in a capsule with a crew of three. They orbited the moon and they landed in the Pacific Ocean and were picked up by a United States Navy warship. All as actually happened 104 years later. However, the way he got them to the moon was through heavy artillery. Capsule was fired by a giant cannon. Okay, not far from here, actually. <laughs> it's very close. Go look for it. it. Might be there. Anyway, the the um, because he was a 19th century mind grappling with a 20th century problem, and I'm a 20th century mind grappling with a 22nd century problem. So if people on Mars read the case for Mars. Uh, you know, 150 years from now, and I, I will, it's going to be retired reading. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, they pick it up, they're going to say, this is really interesting. Here's this guy who wrote this book back in 1996, um, and he talked about terraforming Mars. Wow. But doing it with fluorocarbon gases and green plants, how 20th century can you get? <laughs> how quaint. Okay. Of course, he couldn't realize that we would do it with self-replicating nanorobots. Okay, but there it is. But the fact that I can lay out a way to do it is sort of an existence proof that there is a way to do it. But they'll do it better. Sir. You, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I was wanting to ask you about, uh, well, in this class we learned about uh, Mars base design or Mars settlement design. And just before I ask my actual question, I was wondering if you're familiar with the designs of uh, Eckers Leo Callahan and uh, AI Spike Space Factory for the Marsha uh, design con concept for a Martian settlement. And I was wondering if, um, would you see, do you see the Mars direct way using the paths um, and creating this patchwork of, of paths as a, as a first idea for, for a colony? Or do you think that your Mars direct idea could be modified to integrate the, the technologies that AI Space, Fact Space Factory or Hassel and O'Callaghan are working on, um, on uh, for settlement? Well, it can be integrated with lots of things. Uh, the, the landing of HABs is, is just the first stage because you fly to Mars in these HABs, you leave them on Mars, you start setting up houses on Mars, you start linking them up, okay, so forth. But you're going to want to go beyond that. Uh, okay, people have talked about creating underground vaults on Mars, similar to like whole subway systems and creating vast underground habitats. People talk about domes. Now, you can't create a dome of, of miles across, like you sometimes see in science fiction, because the pressure on the inside, the, the bigger the dome is, the, the greater stress it creates on, on a dome. Um, but you could create domes 50 to 100 meters in diameter and link them up. So now instead of just linking up these tuna cans, you're linking up domes that are football field size kinds of things. Uh, and then perhaps underground vaults under them as well and so on. So that's how I see the Mars cities growing um, until such time as we have terraform. Now once you create the partially terraform Mars that has a thicker atmosphere, that it, in other words, the atmosphere is not breathable, but it has substantial pressure. Then you can create very large domes because there is no pressure difference between the inside and the outside. Then it's like one of these inflatable tennis tents that you see that, you know, that you just put a slight pressure difference between the inside and the outside, and boom, you can make a, a, a big dome. Um, that you could do. Um, but anyway, that's my idea on that. Yes? Yes? Well, nuclear energy has a lot of potential application. Uh, first of all, yes, energy. You can create some solar energy on Mars, but it's unreliable and not that attractive because the solar flux on Mars is only 40% that of Earth. Okay, so, okay, so solar energy on Earth is um, not yet really competitive with fossil fuels or nuclear energy, but it's getting there. But this is now a factor of two worse. Uh, and you don't want to be fully dependent on it anyway because it could be dust storms and you could lose your solar power for weeks at a time. Um, so you definitely want nuclear energy in the mix and supporting a Mars base. Now beyond that, um, there's nuclear power for space propulsion. Okay, now I showed you one vision of that early on and I disparaged it because that is of a future that is not needed for our first human missions to Mars. It's like, you know, Columbus selling his expedition to Queen Isabella and somebody coming in and saying, no, you need a 747, here's the picture. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, it, you waited for it, they would have had it to wait a long time. In fact, it never would have come because the airplane was invented in America. But the, uh, um, but there, one thing that I find um, very interesting um, well, nuclear energy is also very useful for outer solar system probes. It's needed to power them. If you're going out Jupiter and beyond, the solar energy is, is just too weak. And, and you need it to power the probes. You can use it also for powerful instruments like ground penetrating radar, high data rate communication, propulsion. Um, but the thing that really excites me in the nuclear is not nuclear fission, although in this plan we are using the fission reactor because that's what we have now. Uh, fusion. Um, and as I'll talk about tonight, 
there is an entrepreneurial revolution in space that has inspired an entrepreneurial revolution in fusion power development. And fusion is not just another way to light the light bulbs here, although it is that. It, it's a new form of energy that allows you to do new kinds of things, including fusion rockets. And a fusion rocket can generate an exhaust velocity as high as 7% the speed of light. And it's generally possible to engineer a rocket to do up to twice its exhaust velocity. So you're talking about vehicles that could get up to 10% the speed of light. Now that's not just a capability for getting around the solar system fast, that's a marginal capability for interstellar travel. So, uh, you know, uh, fusion uh, will play a role. Um, so, silence your cell phones, please. <laughs> uh, um, the, um, um, in terms of the grand future of humanity, the future has a role both on Earth and space, yes. Sir. Do you think that private corporations have a negative impact for our future in the space? being privateer with SpaceX in the next generation of the ISIS space station being privatized and then with China opening their doors to their international space station but denying us resources on it? Um, I think it's mostly positive. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about this tonight. The thing that's very positive is the entrepreneurial space race to create cheap space launch capabilities. Uh, you know, we... Um, had 40 years of stagnation of space launch capabilities in terms of price from Earth to orbit from 1969 to 2009. But since 2009, the price of space launch has fallen by a factor of five, and that's largely due to SpaceX. Um, and they've ignited a private space race, to, and they're going to drive the price down, and that's going to make all sorts of things possible in space that weren't possible before. Um, now. The privatization of the space station, I'm less enthusiastic about because what it really represents is the U.S. government abandoning the space station. Um, the, uh, so, um, overall, it's a positive development, but there are some negative aspects to it. NASA has two different modes of operation. Okay, it has what I call a purpose-driven mode, and it has a vendor-driven mode. Okay, in a purpose-driven mode, it spends money to do things. In a vendor-driven mode, it does things to spend money. Okay, the Apollo was a purpose-driven program. The purpose was not scientific, it was geostrategic, it was to astonish the world with what free people could do, and it did it. Okay. Uh, no one was looking, however, to stretch it out, to make it more expensive, to make it slower. Quite the opposite. The science program of NASA, including the space probes, the space telescopes, the rovers on Mars, these are purpose-driven programs. Okay, we didn't send Spirit and Opportunity to Mars in order to give business to the airbag conglomerate. Big airbag. No, we happened to use airbags because the engineers said that was the right approach for that particular mission. Okay. It was about the mission. It wasn't about who gets the money. Now, however, the human spaceflight program, post-Apollo, without a clear goal, became largely vendor-driven. It became, here's this big program, and it's spending a lot of money. Which districts are going to get it? Uh, do we get our piece of the action? I mean, if you look at the shuttle program, for example, there were about 130 shuttle launches. Five of them were really great. Uh, in terms of what they accomplished, that they launched, repaired, and upgraded the Hubble Space Telescope. There's maybe another five or perhaps ten at most that can be justified for various other things they did. The other hundred, they're flying the shuttle in order to fly the shuttle. Okay, They were literally doing something in order to spend money. Okay, and. Yeah, well, okay. 
you, you, you take a look at the Columbia accident, the one that happened in 2003. Okay. Now, I've got to get the picture here. Okay. Columbia. Crew of seven. One of them is, was an Israeli pilot who knocked out Saddam Hussein's nuclear reactor. Okay. That is something worth risking your life to do. Okay. What did they risk their lives to do on Columbia? Well, they flew an ant farm. They um, also had an experiment in using recycled urine to do watercolor finger painting. I'm not making this up. This was justified on uh, the argument that astronauts going to Mars are going to need diverting. Watercolor painting is a possibility. Can we recycle urine to make our watercolor paints? This is what this guy died to do. This, I don't know if people know the story, but you know the, 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 you know the, the Marines planting the flag on Iwo Jima? OK. One of the Marines that led that died after the war by falling drunk into a puddle of water and drowning on his way home from the bar. So he survived Iwo Jima to die in a puddle of water. Okay, and that's how insane this was for people of that quality to, to die for that. Okay, and so, you know, and this was one of the things that NASA came under fire for in the investigation afterwards. Not just the mistakes that were made that caused the loss of the mission. Mistakes are going to be made. And, I mean, frankly, you've got to understand this. If you're going to do a human space flight program, you're go people are going to be at risk. Some people are going to die. It's going to happen. Okay? Uh, and, but everybody who goes on these missions knows that. They are willing to take risks in order to do great deeds. But, the, the, but what, was they, what was the Columbia crew risking life for? Okay? And... Uh, Anyhow, I digress. Um, so Artemis, yes, who, by the way, was the goddess that killed Orion, if you know your mythology. It is not being approached from the point of view of a purpose-driven program. It is being approached from the point of view of a vendor-driven program. The lunar orbit gateway, or deep space gateway, or whatever it is called today, uh, is not needed to go to the moon. In fact, it was dreamed up by NASA as a place simply for the Orion capsule to go visit before there was a moon program by Charlie Bolden, the previous NASA administrator, who did not believe we should go to the moon. Uh, and the Gateway is a make-work project uh, that will cost a lot to build, it will cost a lot to maintain, and it will add uh, propulsion and phasing requirements to every mission that's forced to use it. Um, and uh, Furthermore, the mission plan they've come up with using the Gateway involves four launches per mission, uh, five different flight elements, and six rendezvous for every mission, uh, which is insanity. That's 15 things, any one of which it goes wrong, you lose the mission. By comparison, Apollo was one launch, three flight elements, and one rendezvous. So I have... Um, a low opinion of, of the way the Artemis program is being run. I, I, I can't say. I, I, it is being run um, for, uh, why, why are there 15 things in the mission? In order to give 15 people something to do. Okay, it's like writing the school play with a part for every kid. Okay. Um, and uh, whereas this is a show where you want the fewest number of parts. Um, and uh, because you don't want to play where if one kid gets sick, the whole show has to stop. And the, 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 uh, so I have uh, proposed an alternative plan, which I call Moon Direct. Uh, if you want to see a write-up of it, uh, you can find it online. Just Google Zubrin, comma, Moon Direct. There's an extensive discussion of it in a uh, science policy magazine called The New Atlantis. So if you write Zubrin, comma, Moon Direct, New Atlantis, you'll see the write-up of Moon Direct, which is a much more efficient moon program. I'm not against going to the moon. I'm against 
a vendor-driven plan that gets to the moon in the slowest, most expensive and uh, uh, way possible, uh, with the greatest complexity, with and, and which imposes the greatest barriers on ever going any further because it's going to tie up all of our space assets to do it their way. Do you have any thoughts or ideas about how to choose Yes. Um, and in fact, I gave a paper at the International Astronautical Congress last month called Mars Direct 2.0, uh, doing uh, uh, Mars Direct using starships. And uh, I actually uh, uh, posted the paper on the Pioneer Astronautics website. If you want to see it, you can go there. If you go to Pioneer Astronautics, and then if you look around, you'll see there's a list of papers written by me. And so there's the Mars Direct 2.0. And uh, and this, by the way, is um, also goes to answer a question that the gentleman um, in the yellow shirt asked uh, earlier about who's actually trying to do it now. Uh, the person who's really trying to do it now is Musk, SpaceX. And he's developing a fully reusable two-stage, two-orbit heavy lift vehicle called Starship. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very much in favor of that development. I think it's enabling. Um, it has a capability comparable to a Saturn V, but it's fully reusable. It will cost one-tenth as much, or one-tenth as much as the SLS, uh, which also is a heavy lift capability, but is expendable. Uh, however, Musk talks about his plan, which is derived from Mars Direct, is to refuel the upper stage of the Starship on orbit, with a succession of additional Starship flights that bring propellant to it, and then fly that second stage Starship all the way to Mars, refuel it on the surface of Mars with indigenous propellant made from Martian water and CO2, and then fly it directly back. Now that's a purpose-driven approach. It's not building a giant spaceship for the sake of cruising around in a giant spaceship. It's direct, direct. However, in my view, it's not the most efficient use of the Starship. Because, um, first of all, it, it well, let me just say what I think the most efficient, my, I would simply use the Starship as a fully reusable Earth to orbit vehicle and stage off of it, okay? Just like Mars Direct does. That's how I would use it. Um, flying it all the way to Mars and back increases the propellant making requirements on Mars by a factor of 10 which means increases the power requirement to make the propellant on Mars by a factor of 10. Uh, and that's a real problem. Secondly, uh, as far as the Starship is concerned, if you just fly it to Earth orbit and back, you could use it again the next week. If you fly it to Mars and back, it's going to be three years before you can use it again. So you get much more utilization out of it um, by um, just using it Earth to orbit. If you wanted to, you could refuel it enough in Earth orbit to have it go on a near-Earth escape trajectory, like the kind of trajectory you would take going to the moon, a translunar injection cap uh, ellipse, and staging off of it from there. In that case, the Starship comes back to Earth orbit a week after it left, and you could use it again the next week. Uh, and now you can send a very heavy payload to Mars because the Starship is delivering it to almost Earth escape and then it just needs a little extra push to go the rest of the way. That's an alternative that also is worth thinking about. But I would not send the Starship itself all the way to Mars because you've got this, this vehicle with 120 ton dry mass to have to refuel to send back from Mars instead of something maybe with a 20 ton dry mass.